education, right? You, you surround yourself with like-minded individuals. And I got into a group with the education to learn what this is, how to underwrite deals, how to source deals, how to fund deals. My strategy in the early days, or the, my why, was to have some consistent income. Right. I was in a sales role. I had a growing family and sales, just like the economy, has ups and downs because of business cycles. And what I did know, what I learned was that having some rental income uh, would have, would provide some stability for my family. And what that looked like was when I moved, we saved up enough money to have a down payment and keep our house that we purchased and we turned that into a rental and I really like that so then I bought another rental and another one I got into wholesaling and flipping and I just got into a whole lot of single family activities as a as a side hustle I guess yeah that's always how it starts and at one point did you pivot mm -hmm. and why did you pivot into multifamily because it was an ever-growing side hustle and I could not scale and and so last year obviously was just a banner year for real estate and everything that we touched seemed to have the Midas touch, right? And I was just coming home at one o'clock in the morning after dealing with subcontractors and, and managing all that. And after every single project, I was starting from ground zero, but I was watching one of my lenders is a syndicator. And I called him up one day and said, I'm doing something different, obviously. You know, this is good, but you guys just keep building on your portfolio and it keeps getting better. And so we went and we had lunch uh, after I handed him his hard money loan back after closing a deal. And and he said, you know, this is why this is the difference. And and so from there, I hung up the hat on single family and, and put it all into multifamily. That's, that's interesting. And it's very common that most people, many people get started in single family house investing because that's what everybody talks about in the books and the meetups and, you know, and, and TV is, as well. It's, it's cool that you're able to pivot like that. And, and most people will then pivot because for the same reason you just said, you can't scale. And it seems mm -hmm. like you kind of created a rat race a little bit. So how did you get into then syn the syndication world? Like what were your steps and how did you finally get in? You're like, oh, I got to change. But then what did you actually do to get into that? Into that Education, right? You, you surround yourself with like-minded individuals. And I got into a, a group with the education to learn what this is, how to underwrite deals, how to source deals, how to fund deals. And we together have, it's been a great community. Uh, and so I just followed the lead of, of my hard money lender at that time, who was a good friend. And I joined the same community as they, as they were in. It's so important is education and community, right? Those are really Absolutely. The, the two things that will get you in. And also when you do that, uh, I found that your entire perspective changes. When you get into a, whatever community it is and you see these people and the things they've accomplished and they don't seem much different than you up. This guy can do it. This guy can do it. I can probably do it. And it just gives you a lot of, lot of confidence. And so mindset, yeah, mindset. That's, that's a, that's a, that's a big thing. Um, and then, so yeah. you, you started doing deals, you started raising money. Talk a little bit about that. Yep. So I was very quick to invest as a limited partner and I'm still investing. You know, I have a self-directed IRA that I will invest as a limited partner on multifamily deals. But I began to see and and all the activity in this community, it's inspiring. It is truly inspiring. It just makes you want to do more. And so I knew that with my sales background and my interaction with people in all sorts of business that maybe raising capital and syndicating deals was a good avenue for myself to get into multifamily. I want to know because you have this unique perspective is that we all know in the syndication business or construction business, we've had major issues. In fact, arguably, you could argue that uh, the problem with COVID wasn't rents or even eviction moratorium or anything like that. It was really related around an inability to turn units on time and on budget. And it was really related to inflation and price run up. It was related to not getting certain supplies. It was related to people not showing up for work. And, and you have a very unique behind the scenes look at maybe what's been happening behind the scenes. Can you try to explain 
kind of what happened since COVID and why we're seeing what we're seeing right now? Perfect. You started with the end. <laughs> But yeah, you're absolutely right. And I will start from the beginning. That's where I operate is in that global logistics. And and so what happened was COVID, right? The U.S. announces a 14-day shutdown. And what that meant was the U.S. consumer could no longer spend dollars on what they're normally spending dollars on. What do we normally spend dollars on? Travel, right? Restaurants, concerts, all of these things that we're normally spending dollars on, well, they now got consolidated and we could only spend dollars on consumer goods such as Amazon and Lowe's and Walmart. And so this drove that demand to sky high levels. And I would venture to say that 90% of those products were made overseas in China and Southeast Asia which are moved primarily by boat. And so all of the product on the shelves throughout the distribution channels were quickly depleted and the demand for those products shot up and the ocean vessels did not stop moving. But what did stop was the labor at the ports. Mm. So there was a slowdown there and this created this massive backlog at all of the ports. And why would the labor stop? Was it due to literally the health-related aspects of COVID? Well, there was a shutdown, right? So everybody had to stay home. And so they, while they did not stop, the shift work became safety-focused, right? Safety of the employee first. So they had these odd shifts and only so many people in a certain area at a time. So while you could unload a vessel, in 90 to 120 minutes, this began to be a two to three day time period. And, and so the vessel turns really slowed down at every port. This just went on from March to mid of last year. And then what happens when a demand for a product really, really increases? Well, that product price skyrockets. And then my business is the transportation of that product. And I will I will use real life scenarios of money for my entire career, almost two decades now, the price for a container from Shanghai to Houston, Texas has been around $3,000 to $4,500 any given season. The containers that we're talking about have gone up to $28,000. Oh, wow. So put yourself in the, in the shoes of a, of a business owner who has an annual budget of $500,000 just as a bottom line item, right? Before net or operating income, $500,000 for transportation. Well, that is now anywhere from 2.5 to $6 million. And the challenge with that is that the price, the retail price, their goods had adjusted to reflect recouping that money yet. Not until Q2 of this year. Before you, that, before you go there, the one thing I don't quite understand, I understand the demand outstripped supply and it was exasperated mm -hmm. by, by COVID. But what I don't understand, you know, you know, nine months, 12 months, once we were back from lockup, why were not people not going back to work? Why didn't that, in other words, why didn't it normalize to what it was before? Is it because the supply was so sky high? Uh, is it a combination of people not going back to work or why did that, why did that not go back to what was more normal. You have to be a little bit more specific about industry, right? Because I know that where we're at here in Houston, I, I think that the restaurant industry is still having trouble. And um, aside from that, it has to do with pay, you know? So from a labor perspective, it's it's more aligned with pay. Let's do, let's do logistics. Like the example you just, you just talked about, right? So the container went yeah, from 4,000 yeah. to 28,000. Why in the world is it still this high? Why didn't it go back to $4,000 when everybody came back? And theoretically things normalized, but they didn't. Let's go back to Q2 of this year. Those containers were still moving at that level. Companies are still paying this amount of freight. And the reason is they want that product on the shelves to sell to the consumer. When did inflation become a news item? Inflation became a news item around May, June. Meanwhile, that's when demand stopped. And I will tell you that May container prices were this high. June, they dropped 50%. So I was beginning to make predictions that we would be at pre-COVID levels by November. As of today, we're below $6,000. Mm -hmm. So 
you've made the, a fantastic point is why haven't they? It takes a little bit of time, but those prices are catering right now.